Did you get one there? 175 years ago. I'll just sit in front. I never wanted to sit in front. Let's start this thing. Go ahead, Ross. Thanks, and thank you all for coming to the uh, Las Cruces International Film Festival. If you don't know, uh, this is our fourth year with the biggest film festival uh, in the country put on by a major university, and that's New Mexico State University. <laughs> I am uh, I'm a professor of the uh, Creative Media Institute. Which you going? <laughs> uh, we're, uh, we're here to, to learn a little bit more about George Lopez. So I'm going to start out with some questions myself that I have for George, and then we're going to open it up to the audience, okay? Does that work for you guys? Just so a reminder, tonight at 7 o'clock, if you've never seen a film that George did called Spare Parts, this film is fantastic. We're screening it at 7 p.m. at the uh, Allen Theater Cineport 10 at the Ball. And George will be there. He's going to talk about the film. This is an amazing movie with George, Marissa Tomei, Jamie Lee Curtis. Fabulous movie tonight, 7 o'clock at the uh, Allen Theaters. And then we have movies going all day today, all day Friday, all day Saturday, uh, all day Sunday. So please, you know, take advantage of this incredible opportunity. <laughs> You sure you're not Latino because we usually say all day instead of a particular time. <laughs> like we don't say five, we say all day. <laughs> so Spare Parts is about uh, uh, a high school in Arizona that these uh, children who were uh, of immigrant backgrounds um, uh, had a teacher that came there and started a robotics class in, in the school and then they went on to compete against some of the uh, biggest universities around, and it's a great uh, inspirational film. Yeah, you said it's like stand and deliver, um, dive and achieve. So uh, if you come and see it, you'll like it. And then you'll never look at a hair dryer the same. Because you'll be like, there's a motor in there, I could probably take it. <laughs> right? <laughs> so I, I have a question, George. Uh, these are all young people with their very bright futures and dreams and aspirations. How did you get started, and when did you first know you wanted to be an entertainer? Um, let's see. Well, I think that uh, the way that we're brought up is uh, of suppression. Like, they don't raise you to be... Uh, fearless, they raise you to be fearful. Don't go over there, don't go in there. If you go, like we all have a room in the house, even if it's a two bedroom room. One room, your parents sleep in, the other one has the kukui in it, and nobody, <laughs> nobody wants to go in that room. So it's a culture of, of fear. So I would say that, first of all, you have to overcome your fear of failure, because there's no, fa there's no failure in failure. There's only failure and not trying. So in telling my grandmother that I wanted to be a comedian and her telling me, I'm funnier than you. <laughs> and I think she was funnier than me, really. Uh, but, but, but all of that negativity I used to, to create a positive uh, thing for me. But I was scared to death about everything. I was scared to death about you know, going to the comedy store June 4th, in 1979. So this June 4th is my 40-year anniversary in Spanish. And, you know, I quit, I quit at everything that I had ever tried to do. Uh, and I put on the list accordion, but I think everybody quits at the accordion. <laughs> like I begged my grandmother to, to buy me these 10 lessons. And I, but, I, I, but what I had was an ability, like a wanting to perform. You know, I liked music and I, I wanted to play the guitar and I was in choir in seventh grade. Like I wanted to perform and I was afraid. So um, uh, in, in, um, in, in preparing to go to the comedy store, I mean, it took, I can't even believe it. I mean, I can't believe that I went over there and it was so bad and then kept going back with no pay or no future. So, uh, but I've always felt, but I sensed that I always felt different than, than everybody that I grew up around and, and I always felt like I could be something other than what those guys settled on being. You know, they worked at General Motors or they worked at Lockheed building planes and they were in all those places. 
And I, I didn't want to settle for that. I never wanted to settle for, uh, for that. And, you know, it cost me a lot of friendships. It cost me a lot of, um, you know, a lot of uh, time that I missed, that I thought I was missing with my friends, but they're, they're always there. So I would say the best invention, the best investment that you can make from this day forward is an investment in yourself and look at the things that make you fearful and try to eliminate them and then don't ever have anybody in your life that's not supportive of you and that doesn't think you can be what you want to be. That's right. uh, but yeah. Yeah, so yeah, so 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 I started to do that, and then um, I quit at uh, at baseball, which I loved my whole life. I quit at baseball in, in my senior year, and my baseball coach and I uh, had a had a big argument, like face to face, and and he said he called me a quitter, and he said that my life was going to be awful because I quit at everything when it got tough, and I said really, and he said yeah really, and we went like nose to nose, and. Uh, about four or maybe five years after, I quit at golf, which I really liked. I was playing golf, and when golf got hard, I quit. And I was already doing stand-up, and I quit, and I'd go back. And one day, I played like nine holes with these guys, my friends, and I said, you know, I'm, I'm going to take off, because I made up some excuse to leave. But really, I quit. And when I was in the car, I could hear my coach tell me that I was never going to be anything because I quit. And it's the first time I ever heard anybody, like, kind of a voice in my head say, you know, you're, 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 what, that argument that we had in high school. So I went uh, to the high school, and I, I waited for practice to be over. I waited for the whole team to leave, and then he was out there picking up the equipment. And I walked up to him, and he was surprised to see me. And he said, like, what are you doing here? And I said, I came to tell you that I'm sorry for the way that I treated you in high school, and that you were right about me, about quitting, and I just couldn't, I couldn't live without showing you respect because I showed you so much disrespect that I couldn't, I couldn't go forward without telling you that I made a mistake and that I was sorry and that I appreciated it. Yeah. I hope all you students are listening to that, especially yeah. mine. Yeah. And I never did that. You know, Latinos, like, if you're mad at somebody, instead of apologizing, you'll never see them again for the rest of your life. <laughs> You know, and then somebody somebody will say, you know, like I had a joke where they go, I haven't talked to my dad in 25 years. And you go, where is he? He's in the living room. <laughs> but I use I, I use the culture, everybody knows, I use the culture to raise an awareness that we are stubborn, you know, and we don't go to the doctor. I have a joke right now that my uncle was an alcoholic and he had diabetes and he could have suffered a stroke and he never went to the doctor. So I took him to the doctor and the doctor says, if you continue to drink, you're at a high risk of stroke. You're at a high risk of amputation. And I said that my uncle went like this to the doctor. Ooh. ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> like, you know, who, who, who heckles a doctor? <laughs> oh. And, and that they cut his foot. They really did cut his foot. Uh, and you know what he said in the hospital? He goes, hey, I already walked a lot already. <laughs> That's what he said. And then he said, if you don't believe me, go to my closet and take off my right shoes. I don't need them. <laughs> so, yeah. So, uh, being fearless uh, made me a better person and comedian and actor. Thank you. So, I'm going to follow up to that. Well, it depends what they want to do, but I would say that with the social media and with, uh, you know, YouTube, you know, people ask me how to become an actor or how to become a comedian. Well, everything is there. I mean, all you have to do is go and look at comedians that you like and look at Wikipedia, see how they started, see what they did right, see what they did wrong, you know, so start to start to journal or write things down or make videos of yourself because, you know, you're only going to be this young today. So you save all those things and put them in your computer and you're creating a bank or a reservoir of stuff that you're interested in, read books, ask questions, go to movies and do things that are out of your comfort, your comfort zone. Because we want to stay in our comfort zone and do everything that's comfortable to us. That's why for, you know, 40 years, you're still hanging around with the same people you were hanging around 40 years ago. And, you know, they might be good people, but there's a lot of other people out there that are good people, too. And you need to travel and, and, and try things and, you know, say things and, and just, you know, be living forward and not living in the past. All right, thank you. So I'm, I'm going to ask you to retell my story, because this is one of my favorite stories to tell at the end of lunch today. Uh, how did the George Lopez show come about? 
Well, let's see. Uh, yeah, you know what? I'll tell you this. Nobody thought that show was going to succeed um, beyond that cast. Like the first day of the show premiere, Wednesday, March 31st of 2002, there was a cover of the calendar section of the Los Angeles Times. Big picture of me and the wife and Max and it said, is this the one? And I said, oh, uh, wow. So I read it, and all it was was about all of the other shows that had failed, that it had a Latino cast, and the whole article was very negative. So when I went to work, everybody was kind of like, you know, silent. And I said, what's everybody, what's everybody's what's the problem? It was the first day, the premiere of the first show. And they said, did you see the LA Times? And I said, okay. So I took the other actors in the makeup room, just us. I closed the door and I said, listen, F all that and F what people are going to think. This show is going to survive because the people are going to love it and we're making it for the people. We're not making it for critics. We're not making it for people to criticize us. We're making it because this family has never been seen on TV before. And is this the one? And I said, you're fucking right. This is the one. <laughs> And since 2002 to today, that show has never been off the air. And in the history of television, three Latino lead actors have been lead actors in a television show. Desi Arnaz was an I Love Lucy, not about him. Chico the Man was Freddie Prince, not about him. And me, George Lopez, about me. So the way that it came about is that I was in uh, Austin performing at a comedy club and I was at a really dark period in my life. I was drinking a lot and I didn't think I was very funny and I was just kind of going through the motions as a road comedian and someone had told me that Sandra Bullock was going to come to the second show and I was like, oh. Please, God. I went into the I went into the dressing room. I closed the door, and I literally I never do this. I went, please don't whoever, whoever's up there, don't let her come to the show. Whoever, so when the show started, manager came in and she goes, hey, she's not coming. She called, said she's got busy doing something else. So cut to like a year later, a guy comes and sees me, and they said that there's a TV project that they're interested in being. So he saw me. He went away for a year. The, um, July of 2000, I find out that it's Sandra Bullock, and she comes to see me August of 2000. And after she saw me, she came to the dressing room and said, I have an idea for a show, but it's about kids. I don't think my idea can be as interesting as what you have in your act, your mom, your grandmother, and all that. And that day, um, she said, I want to try to do this show with you. And then the first day that we were uh, supposed to meet, I was hitting golf balls at like 12, 15, I was supposed to be there at 1. And my manager called me and he said, are you, are you on the way? And I said, no, I'm not, because, you know, what's, what is she going to do for me? Like, what, I don't even know her, what's she going to do? So I was already putting the negative on me. So he goes, well, you better go, because they ordered lunch. Like, that's his thing, like, go. <laughs> and they ordered lunch, man, you got to go. They, they called and asked what you wanted. So I went, and I sat with her for like three hours, and had, she had a writer's assistant, and we went through all of the characters and stuff like that, and she walked me out. And uh, before she walked me to the door, I said to her, listen, what you're going to try to do has never been done successfully in the history of television. So wherever we go from here, I just want to say, you know, I appreciate it. Thank you. And she looked at me and she said, why don't you worry about being funny? And why don't you let me worry about all that? So 120 shows and syndication till 2022. And uh, yeah, she was right. So I let, I just worried about being funny. And she got me on uh, ABC. You've worked in comedy for me. You're not saying, you're saying a comedy, you're saying a film, you're saying a television, you're not paint, uh, comedy special. You want to change the microphone? <laughs> I like that, uh, I like that 
this college hires minorities to do work as well. My God. <laughs> Woo! What, what is, so what is the difference for you in, in each medium and how do you approach uh, the specific mediums that you work in? Well, I think that stand-up is the is like the frying pan that you cook everything in. Like I, I still do it, I still love it. Um, so everything revolves around being a stand-up. Like I've never disconnected from it because it's been with me forever. It's like I've never I'm an only child, but I feel like I have this person that's with me that helps me write, do all this stuff. And we just I did all my HBO specials live because it scared other comedians to do them live. I just did the one a year and a half ago, the wall at DC, the Kennedy Center. And uh, in that one, you know, we did live, and uh, so uh, acting, I, I'm starting to appreciate acting. You know, we did a movie here called uh, Walking with Herb that's coming out, a spiritual movie with, uh, yeah. Well, in, in the movie, I play, I play, am 